so just to finish up, um, let's just look at some, some video and, and kind of, again, get used to the anatomy. So here we see, again, stomach uh, beside liver. And if we track that kind of across your screen, we then see the, the channel of the pylorus and we get a sense that these are big, there's big muscle here, big thick muscle. Here's another image. Again, I think it's just important to get a sense of where the structure lies so you're not kind of looking around endlessly in the, in the goop of the stomach and of the abdomen. And then here's a nice sign that actually gives away pyloric stenosis. Does anybody know the name of, of this sign? So this is actually called the nipple sign because you actually see the muscle pushing back into the stomach. And it's kind of a giveaway that the muscle is definitely enlarged and obstructing. So the nipple, yeah, you see it kind of pushing back into the stomach. Yeah. Great. And then finally, just a couple other images of looking at the pylorus kind of in its transverse plane. Uh, this is just something to be kind of aware of and not forget about as you're looking around for the structure. If you see this, you know, it, you know, you may have identified the pylorus uh, unknowingly because you're used to thinking about it in the longitudinal plane. But remember, this is what it looks like in the transverse plane. And this is a really good example. Here you can see it again. Excellent. So, yeah, and I think it's important to to then you know go on and make sure you're going to interrogate it really really well. It's it would be a little bit smaller, but and it also looks a little bit funny. Uh, you know, one real ring there. Yeah. Good. I do often think when I see them in transverse, oh, how surprisingly like Nate Tessa looks, but then. When you go to the longitudinal view, I don't think you're ever fooled, and you know you're probably already going into that room with a sense of which of the two entities is more likely causing the issue. So let's move on to some discussion points that really take us back to our objectives. Let me ask, kind of the group, how does this POCUS application impact downstream care, and then what do you think are the greatest barriers to integrating the application into our PEM workflow? So let's start with question one. How does this application impact downstream care? Now we're practicing at a big academic center. So in that context, how can this application help us? When if we can quickly see the, the patterns, the war measurements, it's enlarged, and then we know what is going on. So that's yeah, more efficient, but then the downside is that if we really want to make sure that it's not pattern spasm, then we have to spend 15 minutes <laughs> looking at the patterns, that is not something that is going to be possible to do for a physician, right? I, right. I, I think part of that, when, I, when I've had success with this, the biggest thing that it's helped with is just some of the practical stuff, right? So if you have a baby that looks pretty well, but you have a concerning story for, like often they don't look terrible. Sometimes they're very, very gaunt and everything, but um, often your clinical suspicion is above, you know, a certain threshold where they don't look that sick. So if I do it and I've seen something that looks like pyloric stenosis. Now I'm getting an IV, now I'm getting blood work organized so that the surgeons, by the time they go up for their comprehensive scan in their back, have basically all the package that they need to kind of move forward, um, knowing that you can't necessarily spend all that time to look for fluid contents going through, but have a pretty high suspicion or much higher than you had before you set them off to ultrasound. And then also it's depending on the setting that you're but at the time, like Greg, like these are the baby that at the time they look fine, you have some suspicion maybe this is this, and then you're not going to, you can't arrange like a formal algorithm for them a lot of time. Again, right now we can, but like not of institution, you can't. It's 1 a.m. at night, it's semi-urgent, so then like you need to tell them, well, come back tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, and you know, like another person here, like that's it, you can take the probe and say, like, yeah, it is, or not. Well, it's not. That, uh, that may be the important way to think about all of these is so we're talking about a test and how it might impact downstream care. So that really depends on 
a test characteristic. And whether you, you do your test and it's positive, or you do your test and it's negative, I think there's a big different implications for downstream care. So, I mean, you, you do the test and it's obviously positive. It looks just like all of these scans. How does that really change workflow? Not greatly beyond your confidence. You know, what the patient needs, you're gonna maybe advocate for, yeah, but we know it's pyloric stenosis, and now we have a system where you can send some images to that and say to the radiologist, yeah, but, but look, it's gonna be easy to find. Let's fit it in. How can I admit this kid when I know it's pyloric stenosis and like say I, well, I can't get an ultrasound tonight? It doesn't make sense. So you know the patient gets the care they need. I think the bigger impact comes on if it's negative. And then that all gets tied into it's an operator-dependent test. So if we say, well, the test characteristics are this or that, that all changes based on who the operator is. So I bet you everyone in this room has a different answer to how a negative test affects their care in terms of their confidence with that negative result. For me, it would be a rule in testing. I don't know if I don't see it, if I feel comfortable saying this baby definitely does not have pyloric. Okay. So if I still have high enough of a clinical suspicion, I'm still going ahead with comprehensive. Okay. So you've got a pre-test probability now. Now we're getting even more nuanced. It's not just sensitivity specificity. It's a likelihood ratio and how you're multiplying that based on your result. So you're talking about high pre-test probability. Dis your test disagrees. You're going to do everything the same. Yeah. What about a moderate to low pre-test probability? Kids sent in from an outside physician where you look at that report and say, sure. really? Well, look at maybe. I don't know. Um, uh, and then you do your test and don't, matter, right? don't see a pyloric stenosis like that. I think it depends at what stage of my training. Like right now, I don't think I've done enough to say I have to go the test, but maybe when I get to your stage, then you know, maybe probably just have to be flex and I don't find most of the normal findings and maybe it could be a necessary test that's how you take that strength. Here's another thing I'll toss out there. I'm sorry if I'm stealing any of your thunder, Jason. But, um, so, you know, pyloric stenosis can be dangerous. Usually it's a slow kind of process, but it can disturb your electrolytes and need to be corrected before you go through surgery. What if you knew for that patient with a lowish pre-test probability, a negative POCUS, you're at an institution where it's hard to get ultrasound that night, mm -hmm. and so you do electrolytes sure. and a blood gas, and there's more. Mm -hmm. Do you think that patient needs to stay in the hospital until the ultrasound is done, or is there, does that give you the backup, that combination package to say, let's arrange an outpatient ultrasound, let's arrange maybe close follow-up instead. Um, it doesn't look like a bad case of this now. It can change over time, so you can get a repeat as needed. So I'll tell you that my routine went exactly like you're describing. At the beginning of doing these scans, it was always something where it's like, yeah, but I'm just training. I don't know when I'll feel confident. And then you pass a certain point where you're like, I'm pretty sure it's negative. Let's do a little something else that's reassuring about defending the decision to send them home. And you get to a point where you're like, nope, I'm confident in my name. Is a negative um, that you didn't see that normal finding? Because sometimes you may not see the normal pylorus. Right. So if it's just air that I'm seeing, is that truly a negative test, or am I just not having acquired the proper images? That's yeah, certainly one of those things you're going to wrestle with while doing your, what was my pretest probability in decision making. Um, I think most of the time now, after I've invested five minutes in the scan, um, I'm usually pretty confident about if I feel it's a negative. Um, and then, you know, the logic becomes the same as the reports you get back from radiology, mm -hmm. which are sometimes I don't fully visualize the pyloris or the uh, pyloris currently has measurements of this, but pyloric stenosis is a process in evolution. If symptoms persist, please um, you know, represent for another scan. Mm -hmm. So often my um, advice to parents is along the same lines. Not quite. Yeah, so just kind of to go back to the discussion question one, how does the focus application impact downstream care? I think, you know, just to kind of summarize, you know, if you integrate pretest probability, the likelihood, uh, you know, of your test, you know, taking into account operator variability and someone's kind of experience and their competence, I think it can be very effective for either a rule in 
in removing cognitive load and making things more efficient, depending on how mature your system is, versus if it's negative, like Mark talks about, is probably the more powerful because often then you're moving someone out of a queue. And if you are really confident and if Adam's Civitz's original research kind of holds true, and if we can validate some of that, maybe moving away from comprehensive scans. Because really, if you think about total time within the system, an extra five minutes, you know, in terms of history, physical, you take the machine right in with you and you do the scan. Um, that's not a lot of time to demonstrate if you're comfortable. Now, the second piece was what are the greatest barriers? And, and one of the folks following us on YouTube made a good point about, you know, the relationship with Gen Surge and, and how it can be demoralizing if they kind of want to get a comprehensive scan anyways. And it kind of speaks to, again, building the relationships with your group. In an ideal world, the surgeons that are doing this procedure would know how to do this scan as well. Like they're smart people. There's no reason you couldn't teach them. And that you couldn't do these together in concert and both kind of reassure each other that what you're seeing is accurate and the patient needs to go to the OR. To me, that would be the ideal. Patient presents to the ED, you identify pyloric stenosis, you contact surgery, they come down, you scan quickly together and they go to the OR. So I think that should be kind of what we're shooting for. And if people have good relationships with their surgeons, that's what they can work on. But in the meantime, uh, I think there still is a lot of value. And if you think about the negative, the connotations of a negative scan, then that barrier kind of slips away. So I think the big barriers people bring out, relationships to surgeons, relationships to DI and the need for a kind of a comprehensive regardless. And that really goes back to your own competence. And then really it's just the time factor, which in my mind, even as an administrator who looks at metrics all the time, five minutes is, is not a, a huge amount of money, uh, of money or time. <laughs> Good discussion, and those are kind of the key points. I'd say the only other piece is that clearly across institutions, this is evolving. Everybody's at a little bit of a different stage, um, but I think there's there's quite a bit of potential to look after this, this particular uh, group of patients. So our objectives were to recognize the advantage of point of care ultrasound for use in the assessment of suspected pyloric stenosis. The real advantage is that the gold standard of diagnosis is ultrasound and you're bringing that to the bedside. And again, as some early research has indicated, this is a skill that we can essentially bring right to the bedside with the same kind of test characteristics that we find in diagnostic imaging. And then what's, uh, and then to demonstrate the impact of focus on downstream care. And hopefully our discussion did that and stimulated some ideas about both the, the connotations of what happens with a positive test finding and a negative test finding. So uh, thanks again for everybody's uh, uh, engagement and enthusiasm. I want to thank Mark again for, uh, for pyloric uh, stenosis as a topic. Um, gave me a creative outlet in putting some cases together. Um, <laughs> and then, like I said, uh, you know, Feel free to, to tweet at me if you have some, some questions or you want to talk about uh, what we talked about today.